Lincoln Project has raised $90 million. We have the opportunity to help save the goddamn country. Joseph R. Biden is elected the 46th president of the United States. <laughs> Did you see the article this morning? It's really upsetting. It's in the New York Times. We're going to have to have a talk about John. I talked to victims as recently as the yesterday. The Lincoln Project said it was shocked, calling him a predator, a liar, and an abuser. I started to get suspicious about where did the money go. More people have resigned. It's falling apart. Oh, my god. I literally cannot talk about it. Can't even tell you why I can't talk about it. It's not about ideology. It's about money. It's about power. Why were we trying to cover it up if it didn't matter? I feel like I'd become a victim of what I was fighting against. I don't have any good answers, except I kind of got into being a gunslinger. Well, hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Libby Casey, senior news anchor here at The Post. My guest today is a director of The Lincoln Project, the new docuseries on Showtime. Fisher Stevens joins us now. It's so good to have you. Uh, we are hoping to get your fellow director, Kareem Amir, to join us. Uh, we're having a trouble with the connection, but we may be able to get him shortly. In the meantime, we are thrilled to talk to you about this series. It is explosive, Fisher. Um, remember, audience, we want to hear from you as well. So if you have questions for our director, uh, send us them via Twitter. Just tweet us at Post Live. So, you know, a lot of our viewers, Fisher, probably discovered the Lincoln Project through those cutting ads and those viral tweets that really attacked then President Trump. And they got a reaction not only from the public, but even from the president himself. You know, the super PAC had a big personality, not something we usually think about, about super PACs. How did you and, uh, and Kareem find out about the Lincoln Project and why did you decide to follow them? Well, actually, when COVID hit and I uh, saw the response that President Trump was doing, I was flabbergasted. So I um, got a bunch of my editor friends, my documentary friends together, and we went about raising money and made to make our own ad to say, like, wake up, we need help. Like, this is bad. Then I saw Morning in America and I was like, oh, my God, it's been done and we'll never do it better than whoever made this. And then I found out it was the Lincoln Project. So I started following the Lincoln Project and I started just becoming obsessed with them like many people, just how powerful, how they didn't give a shit about, can I say that on this? I don't know. But anyway, um, <clears throat> they, they, they were just ruthless. And then I realized these are the guys that uh, I've been fighting against in my political activism career my whole life. And come uh, August, I wanted to do something to document the election. And I thought, what better way than to be embedded with these guys? Like, how is it going to work with these guys? Because we heard that they were all going to gather in Salt Lake City, in uh, Park City, Utah. And through mutual friends of Kareem and mine, um, we got a, a connection to do a Zoom with Rick and Steve and Reed and Stuart and um, raise some money. And they allowed Kareem and I to go in and basically be embedded with them um, for the entire, from September, October until the election day. And then obviously things didn't turn out the way we had thought they would when we were filming with them. So we continued filming up until, you know, a few months ago. Yeah, what do you mean when you say things didn't turn out the way you thought? Because they were ultimately successful in uh, helping the effort to make sure Donald Trump was not reelected. Yes, things did turn out in that way, but we really thought we were going to kind of film this group, this this Lincoln Project group uh, to to new heights and that they would stay together and maybe we would, you know, the film would end and and they would still be together still fighting and obviously they had all kinds of inner turmoil and struggles inside um and that became interesting too and we obviously had to document that. The other thing that these guys did predict, and Stewart even says it in the movie, is knowing that the election would be certified on January 6th, he said, listen, I think there's going to be trouble. And he said, January 6th, don't, don't, don't think there might, something might not happen. Um, he said that in uh, November, I believe, while we were filming. So we knew 
that once Biden was elected, that the film wouldn't end also because there would be the Lincoln Project's job wouldn't be finished. They have to keep fighting, which they did also. So they kept fighting and there was infighting inside of the Lincoln Project itself. And we'll talk more about some of that infighting and some of the scandals uh, that let a lot of the partners and people who are instrumental in forming it to step away. But you just mentioned a lot of names. You, you rattle off a bunch of names that, if you watch this docu-series, become very familiar. And if you're deeply involved in politics, they may be familiar names. But if you're someone sitting on your couch watching commercials, these are men, some women, but mostly men, who have been instrumental, Fisher, in steering the political conversation for decades, and they are behind the scenes. So. Tell us about these political operatives and just how powerful they have been in American life. Well, yeah, I mean, I worked, uh, I remember like as a, you know, I started getting involved in politics very young, just doing volunteer work, which I've only done volunteer work, um, working for, you know, mostly, you know, Al Gore and John Kerry and uh, Barack Obama, just working, just volunteering. And obviously these are the guys that fought Al Gore, uh, John Kerry, Barack Obama, these are the guys that were against them. And um, here we are working together. I thought also, what a great scope, what a great lens to watch these guys work and be on the same side um, and watch their, and they are smart. They really are, they're, they're, they're all brilliant guys. Um, and one really wonderful woman, brilliant woman, Jennifer Horn. Um, and I, I was kind of amazed at how brilliant they were and and watching Rick and you'll see in the series you know he creates ads like before your very eye before your very eyes and they're incredible and Stuart Stevens and Steve Schmidt and just the way that they think and operate it was wonderful to have them on your side um on our side and that was what attracted me to this this film uh, to doing this film so i i got a you know i got a first hand seat like a front row seat at, at watching them do their magic. And they really are great at their jobs. And they are they are uh, political operatives and they really know what, what makes people tick. And especially they knew what made Donald Trump tick and they got under his skin. And, and even to today, they continue to seemingly get under their skin. The last ad that they cut only a, a, a few weeks ago is, um, is Trump is still coming at these guys and they come at him. So it's, it's still going on. I mean, they seem to really understand the way Trump thinks. And you see that process play out where they are, I mean, some of these people that you focused on are obsessed with Donald Trump and what he could do and what he thinks. So I want to play a clip from your series. This is uh, co-founder Rick Wilson, and he's describing the goal of the Lincoln Project. And you just get a sense of where he's coming from. I've been involved in a dozen super PACs. None of them had a mission like this. We don't have a client. We weren't here to move some legislative agenda item. We're here to kick the shit out of Donald Trump. Now have Kareem Amir joining us as well, docu uh, director, as well as our other guest, Fisher, of this Lincoln Project docuseries on Showtime. Uh, welcome, Kareem. It's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. You know, we just watched this clip from your series uh, featuring Rick Wilson. I, I would love to hear from you, Kareem, what you found intriguing about these people who were so focused on Donald Trump. Yeah, I, I think what was fascinating is at, at a time when we've seen our political situation, our political uh, realities become so fragmented, where you know, and people are stuck in their ways and, and unwilling to move from one side to the other. To see people who had devoted themselves to the Republican Party uh, and and had the willingness to go against what they had been preaching for years, we thought would be interesting from a character perspective. Because when we make these kinds of films. We look for someone who's going on a journey, somebody who's got stakes, and these guys definitely fit that criteria. They were people on a journey who had stakes, who uh, were going against what they had kind of devoted their lives to, and uh, and it was a point of no return for them politically. Um, and so that's we thought it could be a, a you know a captivating journey for us to, to to point our cameras on. Of course, we had no idea what happened from there, um, but like the best films, you never do. So we, we I think we got very um, lucky to capture this moment of history. Mm -hmm. You know, as we were just talking about a moment ago with Fisher, 
the Lincoln Project was able to get under Donald Trump's skin. And I, I want to point out one thing that Trump said at one point. He said, quote, I'm running against sleepy Joe Biden, but also against some really stupid Republicans who didn't know how good they had it. Um, Kareem, when did the senior team at the Lincoln Project realize they were getting under Donald Trump's skin? Well, I think the 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 ability to get under Donald Trump's skin was part of the ingenuity of the Lincoln Project from the very get-go. Like they had the, um, you know, they they were they started with a New York Times um, uh, column that was quite you know beautifully written, but they never imagined that it was going to lead to this huge success and become the most you know fast-growing super PAC in American history. I think what what their kind of eureka moment is when they start buying up these ads on Fox News. Uh, and the DC, uh, the local Fox News in DC, and the uh, in a slot that's quite cheap, which was kind of from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. Because who the hell is going to be you know, usually watching Fox at that time? Of course, they knew that the president would be. Um, you know, maybe Kellyanne Conway may have uh, tipped off George. Who knows how they knew? But they knew to buy that ad space, and they they were able to get under his skin. And he tweeted at them, and that caused a huge explosion in their follower and their in their viewership. And so I think uh, once they saw that they could kind of like, you know, antagonize the the or troll him, so to speak, they continued to do so. And that became kind of part of their core competitive advantage and 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 and, and strategy that we that we capture. Mm, and Fisher, uh, we just heard Kareem mention George. That's George Conway, of course. Uh, what was his role in the Lincoln Project and how did he, how did he become a character uh, that that we see periodically in your series? I think George's name um, was used. Uh, they 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 needed George to kind of really get. I mean, Steve Schmidt was a name, Rick was a name, but they knew the power of George's name on an op-ed would would really it, it kind of make them have more heft and more bulk. And they they called George, and they they knew George was against Trump, and they asked if you know George could look over the op-ed and kind of you know give notes and sign on, and he did. Um, he unfortunately for us did not go to Park City, was not there. So we, we, he's in the movie a little bit, but we didn't really get to get as deep with George as we would have liked to. Um, and he did kind of play a role at the end there, tried to make detente between the two, the two groups when they started to separate. But George certainly was an advisor throughout and on the podcasts and played a pivotal role because of his name and his name power. Yeah. You know, Kareem, these savvy pros were running these ads that were very effective on social media. I mean, they were irreverent. They grabbed you. They even grabbed the attention of the sitting president. But they make the point in your docuseries that they weren't just throwing out zingers, that they were trying to be strategic and they were using all those decades of experience in uh, Republican operative circles to know where to place the ads, who to get them in front of. Um, what was it like to see them work and see their effectiveness? So for, for me personally, it was quite fascinating because I had, um, you know, I, I made a film called The Great Hack, which was about Cambridge Analytica and, and, and Facebook and the way that was weaponized in 2016. And but I, we had started making that film after uh, Cambridge Analytica, after the election. So I hadn't gotten the opportunity to witness kind of this propaganda work happen in real time. And we had that opportunity, the Lincoln Project, which was really uh, great to see how amazing they were at winning Twitter for the day. I mean, they were such, they were so good at, at figuring out the cultural zeitgeist of what was going on in the country, how to react immediately. And what you see so cleverly in their in their technique is the rapid response. I mean, they would be getting stuff out faster um, than we could imagine. And as filmmakers, Fisher and I were always kind of astounded by it because it's like, it takes us so much longer <laughs> to, make a, to make something. Uh, and to see them kind of react so quickly and, 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 and keep knowing how to kind of you know, hack the, hack the culture was quite uh, remarkable. I think the Lincoln Project will go down as a political technology story. There's no denying it. Like I think they they never imagined that they would be that it was going to be about Twitter. They started before COVID, uh, but they're I think the ingenuity of of what Rick Wilson brought uh, with his kind of tone and 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 Steve's kind of and Stewart's ability, command of history and American uh, politics, as well as the tech savviness that. Uh, Ron and Madrid brought in terms of targeting was a really perfect combination that that was uh, that was quite uh, you know effective.
Let's watch something from your docuseries where we see those ads being created in real time. And we see the process of people like Steve Schmidt, Stuart Stevens coming up with the words and the scenes. And then we see what it turns into. Let's watch. He is the worst president in America in history. He has divided the country. He incited hate and lied to all of us about everything tens of thousands of times. This is good. So then we see, of course, later how these ads actually turn out. I mean, what was it like to watch their minds work? Because there are sections of your docuseries where you can, you see these guys saying words out loud. Like you see the, the idea phase and then you see other people writing it down and they're, they're turning these ideas and phrases into what are very potent ads. Fisher, let's start with you. Well, I, I found it really inspiring. I mean, I've spent a lot of time making fiction, right? So you, 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 you agonize over a line. You, 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 you know, you write a line and then four years later you see it up on screen. I mean, this was like writing a line and then the next day you're seeing it on screen. I love that they were just like willing to, let's just throw this out here. And and they did check each other. They go, you know, there you saw a moment where Stuart was like, yeah, that's good. But, you know, constantly, well, let's try this, let's try that. So, I mean, we could have just done a whole episode just on them writing ads. We, we filmed them writing constantly. I love their balls as well. They just didn't, they didn't mince words, right? And that's something the Democrats are always kind of weighing. Should we say this? Will this go well with our demographic? These guys just said, okay, I don't care. Let's go for it. The difference, the difference that they that was with this than the than what they did with the Republicans is everything they said was truth. When they were fighting, uh, you know, like this, not that I'm saying these guys did the Swift Boat ad, but they did make shit up a lot in when they were on the other side this side they didn't have to make anything up everything they did or said was real so uh, that was a big difference and it, but it was great to see them like just no holds bar and how quick it turned around mm. kareem you told us that something that fascinated you about these people was their soul searching and the fact that they went from being dyed in the wool republicans in fact very powerful republicans behind the scenes to being people fighting against donald trump and even risking their professional futures did the morality of their work over the decades and their ability to steer American politics in the past come up a lot in your interviews as you talk to them? You know, uh, it did. I mean, I think, but and, and one of the things that was challenging is having to kind of focus on what story we were trying to tell at the moment, which was the story of, of, of this last election and not, you know, get too stuck in the past. I mean, I'm, I'm a Muslim American immigrant to the United States. It was very hard for me to, to sit there and hear them talk about the glory days of, of Bush and Cheney. I'm like, I don't know if those I call those glory days. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yes, things have gotten worse under Trump, but for God's sake, like if we're going to start saying Cheney was was the good old days, we got a problem here, right? So, it, you know, but but at the same time, as much as I'd love to have a serious conversation with Steve Schmidt on his views about Dick Cheney and his support of Dick Cheney, in the face of the collapse of the American experiment, perhaps with fascism like beyond the doorsteps, kind of grabbing and 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 threatening and enveloping so many aspects of society, I think you need useful people like the Lincoln Project who know how to bring the fight in a way that the Democrats just don't. And I think that that's what we were focused on capturing. And I think that you know. Um, not allowing people the space for uh, for political redemption is very problematic in, in our society because we need, you know, as Stuart says, you need every useful son of a bitch you can get. And I think, I, you know, I, I stand by that. I think that is a very important thing. Should people be held accountable? Of course they should. But in the face of the of, of what of, of what stakes were, were posed and continue to be posed by the right wing fascist movements that have become the dominant voice, unfortunately, in the Republican Party, this is what needed to happen. I want to talk more about how your politics sort of factored into the production of this series. But first, I've, I've got to hear from you, you know, when Joe Biden won the presidency, how responsible or effective did the team at the Lincoln Project feel? What, what was the mood like? And did they point to each other and say, you did this? Or did they point to themselves and say, I did this? How did it go? I think I think there was uh, there was mixed feelings. I 
they were all very disappointed in a lot of the Senate races. And they were also disappointed that 74 million people voted for Donald Trump. I think it was quite unexpected on their part. However, there were certain places that they focused on, um, certain parts of Georgia, certain parts of Pennsylvania, certain parts of Wisconsin, Michigan, where it was clear that those ads and those that data worked. And so in that sense, there, there was also a little backpack, you know, patting on the back and like that. So it was, but it was very mixed. The, the emotions were mixed. And, and I think at times they felt great, but then, you know, the, the end of the day, there's, they knew that their job was far from finished, right? They knew that Trumpism is still prevalent and that these people are, are who, who decided not to uh, acknowledge Joe Biden as president are going to be a, a cancer in, in society and in the system. And they, need, they, they, they knew their work wasn't finished. And as you guys have said, there were members of the Lincoln Project who were very concerned about January 6th. So what was it like to be with them to witness the attack on American democracy in the U.S. Capitol, Kareem? Yeah, I mean, I think they, um, I think they unfortunately knew how how dangerous the 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 the, the language and vitriol was becoming within the party, and 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 they could see the, the the cowardice among some of their former colleagues who, you know, at one point were criticizing Donald Trump and then could not say anything uh, ever to challenge his his authority or 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 any of his abuse of powers. Um, and we we filmed some of those moments where you could see them kind of talking about how there could be a violent, um, you know, a violent scenario that was likely. Um, I think that it was very shocking for them. You know, I mean, I remember having a conversation with one of them and I, and I, and I said to them, I was like, you know, we saw these kinds of political violent images in, in Egypt, which is where Fisher and I met. We met in Tahrir Square, actually, when we when I was filming uh, during the Arab Spring. and. And we saw how how much the symbols of power could change in a country, but nobody ever imagined images like that in the United States, right? It just you just we, you know I think we grow up with this mythology in America that uh, American exceptionalism is so powerful that it can kind of overcome anything. And I think certainly in my generation we haven't seen any real strife that's caused the country to feel so divided until until recently. So it was I, I felt that you know. They were they were they they were mourning the the kind of demise of 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 some of the some of the some of the ways in which they saw the beauty of the country uh, get desecrated. And I think it was very personal for them to know that they could have maybe had a hand in helping weaponize some of these ideas early on. You know, I mean, it, this January six in many ways is the Frankenstein that I don't think they are directly responsible for, but I do think, as we show in the series, you know, you draw you draw a through line from Palinism to Trumpism to where we are today. Well, even as the founders of the Lincoln Project grappled with some of those sort of existential questions, they were feeling a lot of success. And there were a lot of questions and curiosity about how powerful the Lincoln Project could be in the future. And then it was torn apart by scandals. So. Let's talk about this. The co one of the co-founders, John Weaver, was accused of sexual harassment and sexual grooming of young men, even teenagers. Some of those men were people that worked with him. Kareem, there were the accusations against Weaver, but there were also accusations of people within the Lincoln Project sort of ignoring the allegations. What happened? You know, um, the situation with, with John Weaver was something that we, uh, obviously, we're as surprised by as everybody else. Uh, we never met John Weaver. He was never um, in Utah uh, where we were filming. And when we asked about his whereabouts, uh, we were informed that he had had a heart attack, so he wasn't available. Um, I think different people have different accounts from within the Lincoln Project of who knew what when. Um, and we cover that in, in, in the series to the best of our ability. But ultimately, it was one of the one of the, th you know, I think the when we look back at the story of the Lincoln Project, the fight over the over the money and the fight over over Weaver were the two kind of um, uh, two bullets that that really sunk their um, their success. And I think that they were uh, the, the 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 difference in opinion of what should and should and shouldn't have been done was something that you felt uh, very sharply, especially amongst the different generations in the group. Yeah, I mean, Fisher, you document some of the people of the group, especially the young idealists who worked for the Lincoln Project, just being in despair 
um, when they get a sense of the fights over money and also when they realize that leaders of membership knew about the allegations of Weaver. Um, Fisher, what was it like to sort of film that and have that be part of the story? Well, I have to say it was a bummer, the whole thing, because Kareem and I thought we were just going to make a movie about like this this group and then things took a things did take a turn. Um, and uh, I, I think what we had to do was just capture, we, we didn't judge it, we just kind of put our cameras on it and captured whatever we could and, and then let all of them speak, speak to all the allegations. And it, it, I think, for, well, I would say fortunately, the, the Lincoln Project is, is still working and still making great ads. It's unfortunate that they're not all doing it together. So, um, but I, I'm, uh, I think both Kareem and I were, you know, like you guys, like the public, we didn't know what was, what was going on. We were just filming and then all of a sudden these, these bombs dropped and um, we, as filmmakers, we just tried to capture what was going on. So yeah, that, and to be clear about the bombs, there were the allegations against Weaver, but there were also charges of financial mismanagement. And we see various founders in your docu-series kind of accusing others of like a big rift, of trying to take advantage of people's generosity and giving money to this group. So what happened, Fisher? Why did this group ultimately fall apart in the way that it did? Well, I think it's like what Kareem said. I mean, People started going, well, how much did you make and how much did you make? And and they there was not full transparency. And, and as we say in the show, the system is set up so there's not full transparency, whether it's the Lincoln Project, whether it's Trump, whether it's Biden's administration. So I think the big issue, listen, my I remember when Citizens United was passed, we saw the whole system change. And um, unfortunately, some of these guys were were for Citizens United. Um, and we see th this is a result of all of that, where you can be, you don't have to be transparent and it's legal. So um, we didn't, you know, we asked numerous times, as you see, how much, who made what, when, and they all answered their, the way they want to answer. Um, and we just kind of lay it out there for you, the audience to, to uh, make, make do with what you will. Like, you guys be the judges. This is what they took. I personally know uh, that making, you know, we, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't say I have any of the answers because we don't really have any of the answers. So it's, yeah. I'm just glad it's still around. To be honest, I am, I, at the end of the day, uh, as, as Kareem said earlier, is like, we need these guys, in my opinion, to keep fighting the fight. Now, um, it's up to you whether you want to give them money. I I believe that Rick and and Reed and and Stewart are doing are still making great ads. And we the bigger problem is not the grift. The bigger problem to me is fascism in this country quickly uh, coming upon us. And anybody fighting that and willing to put their necks out to fight that, I'm I'm willing to support. So that's kind of how I I ended up feeling at the end of the day. Yeah, and Fisher, as you said, it's Rick Wilson and Reed Galen, Stewart Stevens are all still part of it. Um, Kareem, what's the lesson? that you want viewers to take away from the rise and fall, although, as you said, it still exists, but fall, the power of the Lincoln Project? That's a good question. I, I, look, I think that we have to, um, I think the Lincoln Project forces us to kind of uh, overcome a lot of the, the the romantic mythology we'd like to see American politics through. I think we, we you know, we grow up in, a, in an education system that over romanticizes uh, the founding of the country and the origin of the country. And as Steve says towards the end of the series, America's always had a, a, a beautiful part and a very ugly part. And, and they've kind of, they're kind of a double helix structure to the origin of the, of the nation. And I think the Lincoln Project reminds us of that because they show us that a group of individuals with a mission and a, a, a virtue-based mission can galvanize a, a momentum and a movement that can actually affect massive change. But at the same time, that the American political system is the ultimate financial score and it has been turned into a business. And that is not the fault of the Lincoln Project or Cambridge Analytica. That is the fault of the reality of our complacency as citizens in allowing for our election cycles to be completely for sale and allowing for political behavior to be commodified and allowing for social media to be weaponized in such a way. So we've allowed for all these things, yet we're so outraged when we hear someone's made money in politics. Like, they, we, 
change the laws, stand up for something. You know, it's like we're so easy to point at our outrage, but we are we're not seeing people get into the fight as much as they should. So I think it's easy to criticize the Lincoln Project, but you have to ask yourself, what have you been doing in the election cycle to actually try to affect change as well? I think that's that that would be my position. But of course, it's a story that teaches us about hubris and about the the issues with avarice and and how uh, an amazing kind of um, thing can 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 rise and fall and as as Fisher says, rise again. You know, maybe not in the same potency, but it's still kicking. Yeah, well, Fisher, I in addition want, to being a director, oh, go ahead, Fisher. Last thing, I I do want to say that the complacency Kareem is talking about is crucial, and it's really the reason we made this, and I. I it's so the reason we tried to get it out. We got it out before the election because we are on a precipice of of things of falling off a cliff. You know, you're looking at you're looking at Italy, you're looking at Sweden, you're looking at Brazil, you're looking at all these countries, and you see where it's going. And we are at that tipping point now, um, where you know we may have a a, a Congress with a, a House Majority Leader who refuses to acknowledge that Biden is president, basically McCarthy, and it's dangerous. And you know the first thing he's going to do is to try to impeach the president and throw everything into turmoil. So I think we can't be complacent, and that's why I I just hope people watch this and they get fired up one way or another, whatever it is you do. Fisher, I want to pivot just briefly before we end. In addition to being a director, you are an accomplished actor. You've been on the show Succession, which is all about power and uh, yes. and really the levers of power in America. So I have to ask you, which one of the characters from your docuseries and from the Lincoln Project would you want to play? Well, I mean, I, I would. I I have to say, I would want to play. I, I'd have to put on a little weight, maybe even lose a little hair more. But I think Rick Wilson would be who I'd. I would love to play Rick because I just love Rick's energy and I just love his his the way it goes. The way I, I I hate shooting guns. He loves to shoot guns, so I'd have to learn how to shoot guns. But other than that, I I, I you know, I can't drive a car very well, but I'd fly. I'd I'd take flying lessons. But Rick, I would say yes. All right. I would want to. You, you have an acting challenge ahead of you, even assignment uh, ahead of you. Well, I'd like to thank you both so much. Unfortunately, we are out of time today, so we'll have to leave it there. Kareem Amir and Fisher Stevens, directors of The Lincoln Project, thank you for your time. A reminder for those who'd like to watch, the series will premiere this Friday night, 8 p.m. Uh, that's Eastern Time on Showtime. Thanks to both of you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching with Washington Post Live. To check out what interviews we have coming up, head to WashingtonPostLive.com and you'll find out all about our upcoming events and programming. I'm Libby Casey. Thank you so much.